you ever struggled to figure out how to pray when you're just really down? Well, we're going to talk about that today from Psalm 61. Hey guys, and welcome back to God's Word Made Simple by Simple Servant Ministries. My name is Aaron Hawk, and if this is your first time visiting with us, I just want to say welcome and thank you for joining us. God's Word Made Simple is an online discipleship ministry dedicated to taking God's Word and making it simple. We want to help you understand God's Word, apply it to your life, and grow in your relationship with the Lord. Also, make sure you hit that subscribe button and turn the bell notification to all so that you don't miss any future videos. We would love to have you as part of our family. So guys, it is a good habit to be in when you're really struggling and you can't figure out how to pray or you just feel like your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. We've all been there or we'll all be there again at some point more than likely. It's a really good habit to find a psalm that speaks to your heart and your situation, what you're going through, and pray that psalm to the Lord. And that's what I want to do today. I want to use Psalm 61 as an example of praying a psalm back to the Lord. And you might ask, you know, why do I want to give scripture back to God? Well, the truth is God already knows everything you're going to say anyway. So it doesn't really matter in that sense whether it's words you've come up with or whether it is something from scripture. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not for rote prayers. Jesus talked about that actually a good bit. Uh, he, he specifically, when he gave the Lord's Prayer, he also gave a challenge not to just pray rote prayers. But sometimes we're struggling and we just don't have the words and we need help to find the words. And this is one of those ways to do that, as well as the Spirit talks or the Bible talks about how the Spirit will intercede on our behalf. Sometimes when there are groans too deep for words, the Spirit will actually intervene on our behalf. So today I want to use, like I said, Psalm 61. I may have said 51 a second ago, hopefully not, but Psalm 61 is what I want to use and just teach you to pray it. So let's go through it. Um, and, you know, I'm going to go through it as if a prayer, but obviously it wouldn't be this long if you were normally doing it because I'm going to be going through it with you. So the, the psalm at the top of my Bible, it has the the statement, confidence in God's protection underneath of Psalm 61. Now, remember, if you haven't caught it before, catch my four secrets to understanding life in the Bible. Um, it's a three-part series. Catch that series because I cover things like this in there where those words, confidence in God's protection, those words are not inspired. Those are editors that put those in there just to give us a framework of how to understand the Bible or, or what to expect in this section so that I can better understand the Bible. But it's very important to understand those words are not inspired. The actual text is inspired. So just be careful of that, especially if you have a study Bible. You know, some modern editor, in fact, is going to be adding all kinds of little notes to your Bible. Um, I'm a big fan of using study Bibles sparingly. You know, when you're first starting out, they help you get a, a sense for what to expect, and they're, they're kind of spoon-feeding you, right? And that's okay, right? You, you, babies have to start with milk, and you have to be spoon-fed at first. But eventually, you need to grow up and read on your own. Um, now, a, a totally different video for a different day. I'm already derailing. Let me get back on track. So Psalm 61, verse 1. Hear my cry, O God, give heed to my prayer. Now, if that doesn't sound like somebody that's desperate and struggling, I don't know what does. Literally, he's saying, God, please listen to me, right? Hear me, Lord. Do you ever feel like that? You know, it's that glass ceiling syndrome or the iron ceiling, whichever uh, version of that that you choose to use, right? But it's as if your prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling. You're trying to talk to God, but it doesn't seem like anybody's listening other than you to yourself, which is kind of depressing, right? Hear my cry, O God, give heed to my prayer. From the end of the earth, I call to you when my heart is faint. So I feel so distant from God right now that I'm literally at the edge of the world. And no, I'm not talking about flat earth. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Now, this is very important in a prayer. And the psalm, by the way, would have been a song 
and a prayer, right? Those two are usually uh, used interchangeably, and this is a really good example. Maybe I shouldn't say usually, but they can often be used interchangeably, right? And this is a great example of one that is, right? I mean, let's face it, the songs, the psalms, that's just another word for song, um, they come out of people's emotions. And when they were written, this was somebody that's, that is at an emotional high of some sort, whether that's the emotional high-low of depression and despair or somebody that is just in that high exuberant state because God has blessed them in some way, right? Well, where do you think these psalms came from? They, they came from prayers and discussions that people had with God, okay? So, from the end of the earth I call to you when... When my heart is faint, now there's the first problem, you need to talk to God all the time, but that's not the point here, so I'm, I'm picking on the psalmist right now. Um, we believe to be David. Lead me to the rock. Now that word rock means like the equivalent of a fortress. It's an immovable object, right? It's something that can be counted on. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Now you may even know a modern American song that has these words in it, nice song, love it. Um, we don't know the original tune, but pay attention there. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. See, when we come to God in prayer, it's about humbling ourselves and acknowledging that God is higher than us. His ways are higher than us. He exists in a higher way than us, and He is the only one that can help us. So lead me to the rock that is higher than I is, is saying lead me to this immovable fortress that exists in a higher way. I am now humbling myself and dependent on you, God. That's what this is saying, right? So if you're praying this, simply reading this and saying, you know, God, I, I'm praying to you, Lord, please hear my cry. God, please give, give heed to my prayer, Lord, please listen. I'm trying to talk to you and I'm so frustrated. And by the way, your eyes don't have to be closed to pray, right? I mean, typically you close your eyes, but that's actually more to keep you focused than anything else, um, especially for people with ADHD. Uh, squirrel, um, from the... <laughs> okay, you can laugh at that. It's okay. Uh, from the end of the earth, I call to you when my heart is faint. Make that yours in the moment. You know, God, I feel so distant from you. I'm, I'm struggling. I feel like you're not there. I, I can't take this much more, God. Please help me, Lord. I'm trying to reach out. Right? I mean, that, put it in your own words. Right? Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. You know, God, I know you're God and I know that I'm not. You know, help me. I want to come to you. Help me find the way. Right? Verse 3. For you have been a refuge for me. So now we're looking to the past, right? The, the best way to get through tough times is to look at the past and see how God has blessed you and led you through prior trials. Right? So, for you have been a refuge for me, a tower of strength against the enemy. Make that yours. Go back to some past time where you say, you know, God, you led me through that trial a long time ago. And my brain knows that you wouldn't have done that if you were just going to be done with me now. But my heart, I feel like you're just done with me. So, God, help me, Lord. You have helped me in the past. Please be that refuge and strength once again. You know, pray that to God in your own words. Verse 4, let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge in the shelter of your wings. Selah. And remember that word selah, it doesn't really translate in English. Um, generally speaking, most people just say, whenever you see that word, generically understand it to mean pause, reflect on what was just said. Take a deep breath and reflect, right? Um, goose fraba, if you've ever seen that, right? Let me dwell, <laughs> let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge in the shelter of your wings. And that's simply exactly what it says. You know, Lord, let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge in the shelter of your wings. So remember that tent is the abode, the place where we dwell. So you can simply say, you know, Lord, let me live in your house or in your presence might be a better way, a more personal way, you know. So God, help me to live in your presence all the time. Wow, doesn't that sound like a good prayer? Let me take refuge in the shelter of your wings. And that's, as has been the case in many Psalms and Proverbs, it's that idea of the mother hen clutching her 
what is it, clutch, right? Clutching her chicks underneath of her wing, right? Um, so let me take refuge in the shelter of your wings. You know, one of the things that I, in, in counseling, especially with women, one of the things that I teach people a lot is to pray that the Lord would hold them in his arms and let them feel the warmth of his embrace. Let him, you know, let them feel the beat of his heart. Those two things in particular, I teach people to pray this all the time. And the reason for that is because there's that mental image of cradling a baby, right? And what is a baby listening for? You know, babies are smelling for their mother, but they're also listening for that heartbeat and feeling the warmth, right? It's it's this this mother hen, it's this mother taking care of an infant, you know. And, you know, God is just, and so he has the wrathful part of who he is, but he is also love. And so he wants to cradle us in his arms and demonstrate that love. So sometimes we just need to feel that presence. Even if that is a little subjective, we are created as emotional beings. Emotions are good. Out of check emotions are bad. Okay, let's move on to verse five. For you have heard my vows, O God. You have given me the inheritance of those who fear your name. So you have heard my vows, O God. In other words, the vows meaning I promise, I pledge to serve you, Lord. All these promises that we make to God, these personal promises, Lord, I promise to do better. I promise to do this. And by the way, be careful with your promises, right? Um, The Bible also teaches us not to promise something unless we can deliver it. So don't promise something foolish like, you know, Lord, I'll never sin this way again. And instead say, Lord, I'm going to do my best to turn from this sin and I need your help to do it, right? Uh, I've learned that lesson the hard way. In theory, I have learned it. Sometimes I still am foolish. Um, But you have heard my vows, O God. This This is hearkening to this past relationship that they have had, right? Again, if you're struggling in the present, look to the past to understand that that relationship is still there. You have given me the inheritance of those who fear your name. In other words, he has been blessed by God. I'm not going to get too detailed into this one right now. Uh, Maybe a different video, I would go a little bit deeper into that one. But for right now, that's enough. So verse 6, you will prolong the king's life. His years will be as many generations. He will abide before God forever. So this is now looking to the future. So we have talked about the past. We've related it to the present. We've looked to the past to inform our present. Now we're going to look to the future. And this is where we're going to go ahead and say, you know what, God, I trust you. Even if we don't feel like it, make yourself say those words sometimes. You know, God, I I choose to trust you for the future. And it's okay to say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, right? I'll try and remember to put the scripture reference for that down here. But that's from Mark uh, 9, verse 24. And that's a father crying out for his son to be healed. And he says, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Jesus praises that man for that prayer because he's being honest. So go ahead and say, Lord, I choose to believe you for the future, but please help me to truly have faith in you, right? David right here, he's saying, look, I am looking forward to the future. I know that God is going to do this. And then he goes on, appoint loving kindness, second half of verse seven. Appoint, by the way, random discipleship point. If you ever hear somebody say like verse, this would be verse 7b, they simply mean the second thought or line in that verse. So verse 7 would have verse A and B, 7A and B. 7A would be he will abide before God forever. 7B would be a point loving kindness and truth that they may pers- uh, preserve him. So if you ever hear somebody refer to that, that's, that's what they're talking about. Okay, You probably were able to reason through that on your own, but just so that you're there. Okay, So anyway, let's go back. A point loving kindness and truth that they may preserve him. Right? Remember, I've talked about this in other videos. Loving kindness is a loving, tender care that is based on a past relationship. So it, it's not just this random relationship. There is a history here that is being called upon as evidence, as proof, and as the, the source of faith for the future. So appoint loving kindness and truth that they may preserve him. 
And right now, David is talking, I believe, about himself in the third person. So in verse 6 through 7, when he's talking about the king, he's talking about himself. You know, David is trying to rule this kingdom. He feels unequipped at various points, um, and he's struggling, especially after some of the sins. So verse 8 so, as a result of these things, so I will sing praise to your name forever. Since God will preserve him, he knows for certain that he will be able to sing praise to God's name forever. This isn't just a flippant forever, like, you know, a million billion years as a kid. No, he's being quite literal here. Because of this, he knows that he will stand before God forever, as well as God had promised his lineage. But anyway, um, that I may pay my vows day by day. And this is also an important concept, the daily victory. See, so many times when we're struggling, we're trying to solve the whole problem at once. And it goes back to, you know, I've, ta I've talked to you guys before in other videos about uh, teaching martial arts and when I'm teaching kids especially. And when I teach the kids, I'm really teaching the adults too in our studio. Um, but I'll say something like, you know, and I, a long time ago, I used to use the classic, how do you eat, a, eat an elephant one bite at a time? But in a kid's class, you mention an elephant. Now, there are times where it's okay to completely cut up, but when I'm actually trying to drive the point home, I don't want them laughing too hard. So I want them doing like the funny ha-ha, not the hysterical hyena laugh. Um, if you work with kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So... Uh, I'll use instead, how do you eat a hamburger, right? Because that gets their attention, right? Well, how do you eat a hamburger? You know, and the kids will go like this or something like that. And I'll go, well, do you just shove the whole thing in your mouth? And the kid will go, no, right? And you get a little laugh out of it, the funny ha-ha. That means they're still engaged, okay? And then I'll say, well, what do you usually do? If you don't shove it in your mouth, what do you do? I take a bite, right? And then I'll say, okay, and what do you do with that bite? I swallow it. And I'll, you know, because I'm playing with them, I'm like, you don't chew it first? Well, yeah, of course, Mr. Hawk, you know. But I teach them that you, you eat a hamburger. And remember, to a kid, a hamburger that's like this big to an adult is like that to a kid, right? I mean, it's huge for them. So I'll be like, look, you take one bite, you chew it, you swallow it. So you eat the hamburger one bite at a time. Well, guys, when you're struggling, you need to handle your business one bite at a time, right? Ultimately, it's between you and God, but you can't take it on all at once. That's when you get overwhelmed, shut down, get depressed, all those bad things. One bite at a time, or in this case, he talking, he's talking about paying his vows day by day. So guys, if you appreciate this, again, don't forget to hit like, hit subscribe, turn that bell notification on so that you don't miss any future videos. Uh, we're going to pick back up next time in one of the other Psalms. So guys, thank you very much and God bless.